So we have had a look at the starter motor components. We have had a look at magnetism and electromagnetism. So it's about time that we have a look at the circuit of a starting system and a variety of different starting systems and have a look to see how they work. Now this is a generic setup. So these are generic ones. They aren't specific to any particular vehicle. They're just an example of what you may see. So please don't hold me to them. Uh, please don't tell me that one vehicle, Fords do it different to Holdens, who different do it different to Scania. Um, everyone does them slightly different. Uh, I understand that. But uh, what I want to do is just to have a, look at a generic look to see how they do it. So here you can see uh, the most common components that we're going to see on our starting system. We have a key to so that we have some sort of control over it. You may have a push button to be able to start it, uh, as well as the, you know, you're having to use a key. We have a battery, we have a starter motor, and as you can see on both of those components, we have plenty of wires. Really, that, that, that's it. That's the components that we have in a starting system, a basic starting system. So that's where we're going to start off from. We're going to have a look at that basic starting system, and then we're going to start adding components in as we go. So here you can see, here's our basic starting system. We've already seen this graphic already. You can see here that we are starting off with the battery, and that that the positive of that battery supplies your ignition switch, which then goes to the solenoid ignition switch terminal. Uh, that there then uh, energizes the solenoid to be able to operate this plunger. The plunger, when it moves to the right, will then, uh, uh, as well as engaging the pinion as it moves, it will also close the contacts. Now these contacts here, are going to be coming once again from the positive of the battery terminal. It's going to flow, the current will flow through this nice large cable into this terminal or onto this terminal. The contact switch, when it closes, will allow the current to flow then out of the solenoid and into the starter motor. Now, this may be a cable or it may be what looks like a bit of flat metal. It's not bolted onto the side. It is insulated from the, the body. Otherwise, it would be a dead short. So once it goes inside, if it is a magnet type starter motor, it will go into the brushes, onto the commutator. The, uh, the, then we, we, will, we will start to see some movement as the armature creates a magnetic field around itself and it will start to uh, repel against the permanent magnets on the outside of the starter motor. The current then leaves on the opposite side via uh, the earth and it will go into the chassis of the vehicle, which then travels back over here into the chassis strap or the earth strap of the battery back into the negative, the starter motor turns. When you let go of the key, the starter motor stops turning and um, that's it. Hopefully, fingers crossed at the end of that, your, your, your engine has started. So what we want to then look at next is what does this look like on a uh, on a diagram? So here we are, we have uh, the the symbol for a battery. The symbol for an ignition switch. And the symbol for the starter motor. You can see the dotted line around the starter motor. You can see that we actually have a motor and then we have the solenoid. And because that dotted line is around both of those components, it says it's all one component. So that is really and truly the basic symbols that we are going to use on our system. And this is how it looks on a diagram. So you can see down the bottom here, we have our battery. It then puts power up to this junction here where it then tees off. It tees off down to the starter motor and feeds power to the motor. Obviously that power can't run straight away or can't operate straight away because the solenoid has to be closed. So back over to here, we see that this at this junction, we see we go off onto a fusible link it goes up into the ignition switch and there we wait for the driver to come along and turn it. When they turn it into the crank position, then the, 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 we have a small amount of current 
that can then travel down along this cable into the solenoid again into that ignition switch uh, terminal that little it's usually a small one either a spade or it could be like a little um, five mil uh, um, thread it goes then into the solenoid and you get those there's those two coils which is your holding coil and your uh, uh, your pulling coil you can see that the holding is earthed whereas the pull-in come down the other way the pull-in then goes onto the uh, uh, onto the um, uh, the positive so once that that switch is closed once it, it's actually the solenoid's done the pulling part the pull-in windings will stop the power then is able to flow directly from the battery into the motor and again if it's a magnet type straight into the commutator through the armature if it is a uh, if it has field windings it will go through the field windings first then it will go through the armature uh, or the commutator and the armature and then it will go out of the chassis down from the chassis over into the chassis strap or earth strap back into the battery and that is our basic key start system again there are more complicated ways of doing it there are different ways of doing this but that is a basic circuit so that's our basic circuit we are going to have a look at adding some of these parts this is the foundation if you have a very if you have an old vehicle or if you have a, a vehicle that um, or an engine or a generator that is battery operated you may find that that is the start system that's all you've got with the start system uh, some of the larger starter motors may have extra solenoids or extra uh, relays to help uh, or to prevent the large amounts of current going through the ignition switch but as a basic circuit that's how it's operating so what we're going to have a look at next we'll have a look at uh, uh, at inhibitor or safety switches so I thought I would start off looking at the safety and inhibitor switches on a very basic uh, level we're going to start off and have a look at something like a seat inhibitor switch so this uh, the basic function of this is that you don't want the lawnmower to start up while you have your feet under the deck where the <laughs> the old sharp spinny blades are um, you don't want to be um, in that position and the manufacturers certainly don't want to have those lawsuits so they fit an inhibitor switch a seat inhibitor switch so that you have to be sat on it before you can start the vehicle therefore getting your your tootsies out of the way this is what our, our previous basic circuit looked like so this is our basic circuit uh, so the, I'm not going to go through it you have a look at the previous video if you want to have a look at that now you can see up here if you watch this bit here we are going to add a very simple switch into this circuit this is what we're going to add so there you go you can see our seat switch as you can tell the uh, we are going to have power coming up to here when the driver turns that ignition key the power will and the current will flow down through to here and it won't go anywhere until the driver sits on the seat as soon as the driver sits on the seat that contact will be made the current will be able to flow down through to the ignition switch terminal on that solenoid it will activate the solenoid power can throw to flow to the starter motor and it will work the same way as the basic circuit does so that's basically how a how a very simple inhibitor switch works now we can then take that a little bit more complicated or we can take it one step further I should say and we can have a look at a clutch inhibitor switch or a clutch safety switch now a lot of manufacturers use this so that the the driver of the vehicle has to be sat in the vehicle and as well as being sat on the vehicle they put their foot on the clutch that means if the vehicle has been left in gear then it is not going to drive away when you crank the engine uh, and diesel engines in particular can be pretty bad for that um, it also makes sure that the driver has to be sat in it because it's all, it's awfully hard to operate the clutch pedal if you stood outside of the vehicle so here is our clutch 
uh, uh, sorry, our seat switch. And what we're going to do is we're going to swap out that seat switch. Just watch that seat switch there. And you now see that we have swapped it with a relay. So rather than having a an actual switch or the power running all the way down to the clutch and back up to or back along down to the to the starter motor, we've now in we're, we're now using a relay. So what we're looking for here is that when the driver operates the ignition to the crank, it cannot start until the driver puts their foot on the on the clutch. We can see here we've got power running up to the relay and that relay is not going to get energized until we put our foot down on the clutch. Once that switch closes, current can flow through down to the earth back up to the battery and then we'll find that this relay is energized. As soon as that relay is energized, we then allow current to flow through the relay down through here into that ignition switch uh, terminal that's on the solenoid. And then as previously explained, the solenoid closes the contacts and power throws, uh, current flows through the starter motor. So very simply, very easy way of making sure that we don't have to run lots of big cables all over the place to different inhibitor switches. Now, we are going to also have a look at an automatic version. So the previous one was obviously with clutches that has to be done in a manual. In an automatic, it is slightly different because in an automatic, we don't have a clutch. So in this case, rather than using a clutch switch, a, a simple open shut switch, we are going to use this. Now you can see that up here we now have a uh, we now have our auto trans and our auto trans can be put into a variety of different uh, positions now yours may have you know more positions on top of that that's okay i've just gone for a simple one so you can see here that when you have uh, we've still got the basic relay the same as we had before with the clutch operating the same way only this time that relay will only get energized if we have power coming through, or if we have the vehicle, sorry, um, in the park position, or if we have the vehicle in the neutral position. If the vehicle is in either of those, then you will find that then we will energize that relay, which will then allow the power to come through down to the starter motor as previously explained. Now you might find that that uh, uh, that power comes off of the ignition switch rather or off of the accessories maybe rather than being what looks like this one powered all the time but again as I said this is just a generic look just to get the idea as to how this works so that's inhibitor switches now this isn't the be all or end all of inhibitor switches you've got all sorts of different types as well as the seat the clutch and the uh, neutral switch for the auto trans uh, or the park switch for the auto trans um, we can also have things like seat belts we can have uh, you can build in all sorts of weird and wonderful things uh, for, from some of the manufacturers also depends on what you drive to uh, you can have one that operates when when you put your foot on the brake when you have your foot down and off this, uh, on the accelerator you could have just a, a hold uh, button like a dead man switch uh, things like uh, th that you have in trains, um, tractors can have um, uh, uh, just a, a push button or a push on the floor. And yeah, there's all sorts of different types that are out there. So they're there for safety. They're there to make sure that we cannot operate uh, the engine or start the vehicle up um, unless we are either in the vehicle or the vehicle is in a safe condition for us to be able to start it. So as time moves on, we find that we have electronic control units or engine control units or control modules, electronic control modules, whatever you want to call them. We find these ECUs are starting to be fitted to our vehicles. 
The engine control unit, the electronic, uh, the engine electronic control unit was one of the first ones to be fitted. And a lot of that was to do with the emission controls that we needed to affect to try and clean up our atmosphere. The other reasons for it was because we wanted to try and get as much power as possible out of a small engine as we possibly can. That way we can get more power because we've got less weight. We can also, if you're a commercial vehicle, you can carry more things if you can use a smaller engine and get the same amount of power, which means you make more money. So this was absolutely crucial, but it did change the way that the, uh, that the vehicle starts the engine. And I'm just going to take a little bit of time just to go through that. So you see here, this is how our electronic, uh, sorry, this is how our mechanical system worked. We would use a relay and we would use a set of mechanical switches, including the ignition switch and also including uh, the transmission switches, clutch switches, seat inhibitor switches. We've already gone through those, um, but most of those would have been mechanical. We then introduced the engine ECU. And you can see straight away there's a couple of changes. The first one that you'll spot is that the ignition switch here is no longer carrying the power directly to the starter motor. What we've actually got now is we've got the power going directly to the starter motor if we follow this cable down through here. But it gets stopped at a relay, the starter relay. Only once that starter relay is activated or the contacts are closed within that relay, can the power go through to that, uh, that uh, ignition switch terminal. So a little bit different on how this has worked before. And we've also, if you notice, we've also got a crank sensor in here. Now, <laughs> this isn't the only sensor that comes in here and the engine ECU uh, was obviously responsible for operating um, injectors. Uh, if it's a petrol vehicle operating the spark plugs as well. So there's a few other functions. I've just kept these functions down to what the starter motor required for its function to be able to start the engine. So down here, you'll see that we've got, once again, we've got our ignition switch. It is no longer a switch to be able to switch power. It is more of a, ma of a manual sensor. There's power coming down to the sensor, to the switch, when the driver would operate it, it will send a signal back up into the control unit so that the, the engine control unit knows what it is operated on. Now, obviously, we can talk about vehicles, but these things can be fitted to generators, um, air compressors, you know, anything that's got an engine um, that also has an ECU. So it's not just about vehicles. So once the driver puts that switch, uh, that sensor, into the crank position, power can then uh, power or a small amount of current goes up into the engine control unit, which tells it that the driver is wanting to start the engine. What we then find is that the uh, the, the engine control unit will then send power down to the uh, uh, to the relay. That current flows through that that coil, that, that electromagnet in there, it will then energize and it will close the contacts and the starter motor begins to crank. One thing that we had with our mechanical systems was it did rely, normally it would rely on, once you've cranked the engine, once the engine started, you would have to let go of the key. And failure to do this could cause a lot of damage to the starter motor. So in this system, we don't have that direct link with that key. Um, we also want to try and protect the starter motor and the engine the best we can. So what we then have is we have this crank speed sensor. When you crank over an engine, the engine might crank at about two to 300 RPM. But when the engine starts up, the idle speed for the engine might be anywhere from five to 800 RPM. So the ECU has information feeding back from the crank sensor. And the, and the ECU will then interpret and, and basically figure out when the engine started. Once the engine started, it will then disconnect the relay or it will, it will prevent the power from going down to the relay. The relay de-energizes, the contacts open, and then the power to that solenoid on the starter motor is no longer. The starter motor stops work, uh, the starter motor is no longer operational. So basically, that's a quick overview as to how our electronic uh, 
control unit operate our starter motor. So that's a basic overview as to how an electronic control unit operates with a starting system. Um, there's a lot of vehicles out there that will run just one ECU. Um, so things like generators, um, uh, air compressors, some of the marine applications, ag earth ap type applications. Some of the early vehicles as well would have only had an engine ECU. So that's a very quick overview as to how they operate. It should also be remembered that if you've just got an engine ECU, they might also have some of those inhibitor or safety switches fitted to them to prevent the vehicles from being started. So, you know, <laughs> again, this is just a general overview. Um, you're obviously going to find different systems out there with different components fitted to them. But in general, in a basic view, that's how they're working. So now we're going to have a look at some of our control circuits that actually use ECUs and fully full electronics to be able to operate. Now, before we do, we need to have a look at how CAN bus works. In the good old days, we would have an ECU. When it was one ECU, that was no dramas. It only needed to communicate within itself. When we started to add extra ECUs, as long as they didn't have to communicate to any other ECUs, then we had no dramas. But if we wanted the ECUs to talk to each other, for example, we might want the engine and the transmission to talk to each other, then we would connect them up by wires. Then if we then added another ECU, let's say the brake ECUs, if that needed to talk to, for example, the engine, but not the transmission, then the engine would be connected to two modules, whereas the, uh, the ABS would only be connected to one, as was the transmission. If you then added more, then it got quite complicated. You'd find that you know, one ECU might be fitted to all of them, whereas some of them might only be fitted to half of them, and then a few of them may only be by themselves or connected to one. And as you can imagine, in the top left-hand side, you can see the traditional connections. It gets quite messy doing it that way. And that's where we come into CAN bus. You can see underneath we have a picture of lots of ECUs, the same amount of ECUs, but rather connect to them all up individually. We connect them up onto two wires. We call this the CAN bus. I don't want to go into CAN buses now, um, but we do need a quick explanation as to how they work. So very briefly, what they do is it allows the ECUs to put messages out to other ECUs and for those ECUs to then communicate back to them to say, yes, I've got your message and this is the reply. It's a very simple way of doing it. And rather than having lots of wires, we now need to only have two that go around all of them. Now, this is crucial, particularly when we start to see uh, vehicles starting to be fitted with 20, 30, 40 plus ECUs. It's absolutely critical that we can have a way of connecting them without fitting a wiring harness the size of a trunk. So this is where the CAN bus has come into play. And this is how it works on our, uh, on our vehicles. So previously we said that we have the engine control unit and the engine control unit can operate the starter motor and start control the start and st uh, the start of the engine by basically using and controlling the relay and the ignition switch is separate. If we now swap out a control unit, the engine control unit, and put in another control unit, we need to use CAN bus for it to communicate. So here it is, this is what it looks like in a graphical form. We have over here, this is your engine control unit, so that hasn't changed, but you'll notice that we have changed what's connected to it. It still has the crank speed sensor, still has the relay, but it hasn't got the ignition key fitted to it anymore. Over here we have a vehicle control unit. It, this could be, this doesn't have to be called this, it could be called a body control unit. Um, it, it varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. And again, this is just a generic look at what we've got. So you see here we've got the ignition switch, which again is a, is a manual sensor that tells the vehicle ECU, the vehicle control unit, when the starter wish uh, when the starter sorry when the driver wishes to start the engine when the driver operates that and the the vehicle control unit receives a signal from the crank position of the switch then a signal goes up to the CAN bus or a message goes into the CAN bus uh, 
it communicates that message to the engine control unit to say, hey, I want to start. The engine control unit will then act upon that as long as everything's OK. For example, it will check the crank speed sensor just to make sure the engine's not already running. And then if it's OK, if everything's all right for it to start, then it will then, as we've said before, it will energize the relay. And then the power goes through and starts uh, 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 the starter motor will begin to crank. The same as before, once the engine starts, the crank speed sensor picks up on the fact that the engine speed has increased past what the starter motor would do. And then the engine control unit de-energizes the relay, which stops this, uh, uh, which stops the starter operation. Very simple, very straightforward. Now, as you can imagine, we're then going to build on this. So we begin to see our push button starts coming into our vehicles. Now, some vehicles have had, has had this longer than others. For example, motorcycles have had push starts for a really long time. Uh, cars, relatively long time now, at least 10 years. And trucks, we're just starting to see trucks coming through now. Um, that's just a general idea. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule. And obviously, there's been different manufacturers doing things at different times. Now, this push button start has a problem. If you were to just rely on a push button start, i.e. you get into your vehicle and you push it and the engine starts and you can drive away, then there's no security. We need to have some form of security. And that's what the key gives us. So you did see on some of the earlier ones where you had a key to go into an ignition but you had a push button start because that was the security part of the system. But somehow we needed to move past that because it seems daft that we have a key which we could just turn and at the same time you then take your hand off and push the button. So we have to move forward from there. So you can see where we've got our vehicle control units, uh, the vehicle control unit that has our um, ignition key on it and we have the engine control unit so we'll add a couple more control units. Now you can see coming in, we have our security control unit with an RF or a radio frequency receiver. And we also have a transmission control unit. Now, you can notice, notice as well that the CAN bus is now starting to get busy. We're starting to throw out more messages and more signals out onto the CAN bus. And the CAN bus has a way of dealing with this it's able to prioritize which, uh, which ECUs are allowed to talk and which ones are allowed to communicate and who's more important than the other. So one can override the other. Um, now, just to run through how a push button start operates uh, with a vehicle on a CAN bus type system, we have our security control unit. So up here with our security control unit, you walk up and you have a key in your pocket. Now you may push that key or the security control unit, it may pick up the fact that you have a key in your pocket. Either way, when it gets that signal, the security control unit will disable the alarm, it will allow you to unlock the doors, and it will disable the immobilizing system. Now that's really important because you do not want somebody driving away with your vehicle. And that's what's taken over from our keys. So, the driver gets into the car and you'll notice down onto the vehicle control unit now, we've now lost that ignition switch and it's turned into a push start. So once the driver gets in and comfy ready to drive, they push the, push the switch and again, it's a manual sensor. So we've got a small amount of current that will come through this switch. Once the driver pushes it, the contacts are made and the control unit receives a signal to say the driver wants to start. It then pushes that, that uh, message out onto the CAN bus, which is received by the engine control unit. The engine control unit will then decide, well, can I start or can't I start? So before actually operating that relay, it puts out a message. The message would be talking to the security control unit saying, are we OK to go? Is the immobilizer OK? Has it been disengaged? Has the security been disengaged, etc., etc.? And it will put a message back to say, yes, it's all good. It will then also communicate to the transmission control system or the emission control unit 
Now, depending on whether you've got a manual or an automatic, for the manual, it might say that the vehicle is in neutral so that you know it's out of gear. Or if it's an auto, the same thing, it will have a neutral or park. So it will know if it's in neutral or park. It will then put an, a, a signal back via the CAN bus to say to the control unit, yes, you can start or no, you can't, I'm in gear. If everything's okay, the engine control unit will then put a small amount of current down to the relay, it will energize, and then again, the vehicle will start. Power is allowed to go down to the ignition switch terminal. And then it's the starter motor operates as we've previously discussed. So you can see that we're starting to get a bit more complex in our systems. It's not as straightforward as it was before. Um, and we're also having to just thinking about this bit here, we also need to be aware that if we have a vehicle with a non-start, that non-start may not because of the, be because of the starter motor. It could be because of the transmission. It could be because of the security control unit. Um, it could be because of the vehicle control unit. So that we're starting to get a few different things coming into play, which means a non-starting vehicle may not be because of the actual starting system components. We then move on to our start stop. The start stop is a crucial piece of, uh, um, of software that gets built into the engine ECU. And it's all about emission savings. And by I say emission savings, it's also about fuel savings, um, up to 8% or more, um, depending on the circumstances. So it can be quite a significant saving in fuel. It can also be quite a significant saving for the emissions out into the environment. Now we still have our, all, our, our, all of the control units that we had before, but rather than just adding stuff in and we're having a conventional starting system, we need to make a few modifications. So you can see here now, we've now got an ABS or EBS control unit. Uh, we've also got in here, if we look down the bottom, we've got a different type of battery. We have a deep cycle resistant battery and battery sensor. So we've had to do that because the starter motor will start and stop a lot. That can be quite draining on a normal lead acid battery. So we've had to change that out for a better battery. And some vehicles may have two batteries as well. We see over here that the starter motor is now a start stop motor. And what makes it a start stop motor is that it's now more heavy duty than it was before. So the pinion is stronger. It has a better engagement. Um, the wiring inside, the windings inside are designed so that it can take constant operation because it, it, it starter motors can get hot um, and, and it doesn't help. So they've had to be redesigned so that they can actually cope with the stop start, stop start of local traffic. Uh, you'll also notice that in here that the brake switch, we didn't mention it before, but the brake switch was on the vehicle control unit. It's now gone to the ABS unit. And we also have a wheel speed sensor in here. Now there are other sensors, there's other actuations that's going on in here. Um, and some of these switches may be part of other control units. Again, this is just a generic overview as to how it works. All systems are slightly different and they operate in slightly different ways. Uh, there's also lots of different sensors to do other things. But I'm, again, I've tried to keep this to the sensors that will control the stop start. So on this one here, when we turn, uh, when we get into the vehicle, everything works as it did before with the security system. Uh, as we get in, when we operate the control to say I want to start, everything works as it does before. That's when we get in. Start stop operates when the vehicle comes to a stop. So we're not turning off the whole end, uh, sorry, the whole vehicle. We're only turning off the engine. So up here we have got the wheel speed sensor. The wheel speed sensor picks up the movement of the vehicle. Once it senses that the vehicle stopped, then the control unit will then put out a message to the engine control unit to say, hey, the vehicle stopped working, you can stop. Now there's a couple of other things that may come into play there. We may also find that the control unit, it may need to be, if it's a manual, it may need to be that the vehicle is in neutral. It may also need the clutch to be up for it to stop. 
Uh, if it's an automatic, then once you've come to a stop, you need to have your foot on the foot brake. And again, we're over here with the ABS system again. Now, this very much depends on your system. They've all got slightly different ways of working. Um, some of them will stop quite quickly. Some of them will stop after a few seconds. Some of them will stop uh, once you've got your foot down on the clutch and on the brake. Some of them will only stop once it's into neutral. It all depends upon the system. So I don't really want to get into the, like the, the, the dynamics that my car doesn't do this as how you've explained. As I said, they, they, they all do it slightly differently. So within here, once you have come to a stop, um, you're obviously now going to want to go again. That's usually the intention when you're in traffic to try and keep up with the car or the vehicle in front. So when you come to move off, a couple of things that are going to happen. If you are running with an automatic transmission, the first thing you're going to do is take your foot off of the brake. When you take your foot off the brake, over here the brake switch will then turn off a message is sent to the engine control unit to say, hey, he's taking his foot off the brake, therefore it's time to get the engine started. It will then operate the relay, start the engine, or operate the starter motor and start the engine. If it is a manual system, it's slightly more complicated. Um, it will be re it will possibly, and again, depends on the system, but it, what, what you'll possibly find out is that when you go to put it in gear, in other words, when you put your foot on the clutch, then the vehicle will then send a message via the transmission control unit, via the CAN bus down to the engine control to say, hey, they've put their foot on the, on the clutch. And now that means they're probably gonna put it into gear and want to move off. So therefore, again, it will start by operating the starting relay and operating the starter motor. So that's a quick run through of how the start stop system works and how our electronic control units are talking to each other and how they're communicating to be able to achieve our start stop. So again, um, I need to stress that all different systems work different ways. Um, this is a generic look through. I'm hoping that you will get the idea as to um, what's going on within the systems. Some of the systems are quite complex. The software that's used is quite complex. And also it's worth bearing in mind that if you have a start stop system, then your battery or your starter motor probably is gonna be a bit more costly than the normal ones, um, just purely because they have to be built stronger than the normal batteries uh, or the normal starter motors. So there are gonna be some differences in cost here as there are gonna be differences potentially in weight as well. So just be aware of that when you're lifting the components in and out. So as we've discussed in previous videos, the engine control unit and all of the other ECUs on the vehicles can work together to be able to provide us a safe and secure uh, starting of an engine and a moving off of a vehicle as well as a start stop function. The last function that I want to talk about is our remote start. Now, if you haven't picked it already, there is a vehicle parked right up on top of that hill. It's just there. Now, if you were to be, I don't know, having a picnic for some bizarre reason, a long way away from the car, you may want to start up that vehicle so that by the time you get there, it's going to be nice and warm and toasty. Or if it's in the middle of summer, you may want to have it so that the, the, the air conditioning's been running for a few minutes to have cooled the vehicle down before you, get, you can get into it. And particularly if you're in Australia, so that you can actually touch the steering wheel when you get into it. Now, this, this might seem like a first world problem, uh, wanting your vehicle to be hotter or colder by the time you get, it, uh, get to it and being able to start that vehicle up without being in it. However, there are some real genuine reasons why we would want this to happen. Let's take, for example, if you're on a work site. Let's imagine, for example, that you have a generator uh, that's providing power for tools or um, for some test equipment that you use. And let's say, for example, that that vehicle is on the top of a hill. And just in case you're wondering where it is, there it is. And um, <laughs> let, let's imagine for a while that, uh, it's similar to the last scenario, you're working down here. So you obviously don't want to go traipsing all the way back to your vehicle to turn the generator on, to walk all the way back, 
uh, and only to use the tool for two minutes to walk all the way back and turn it off. Um, you know, it may be that you can't drive over there, so you have to walk. And it would be really good to have a remote start to be able to do that operation for you. So there are some real good real life commercial applications for this. Um, remote starts can be used on all sorts of vehicles, um, generators, uh, air compressors, mining equipment, agricultural equipment, uh, cars. Um, there's a whole heap of range or a whole range of, of reasons why you would want to have this fitted. So the good news is we really don't have to build a lot more into this. Once you have your ECUs and all the sensors to go with it that you need to be able to do a certain function, all you have to do is just program the ECU so that the ECU can do what you want it to do. So in this case with the remote start, you already have a security control unit which can communicate to your key. So when you push the key buttons in a certain sequence or if you push and hold a key, uh, key button, um, then the security control unit can recognize that and then communicate out via the CAN bus to the engine ECU to say, hey, can you start? The engine ECU will then communicate out to the other ECUs. For example, it will communicate to the transmission ECU to say, hey, are you in gear? Because we don't want to remote start a vehicle if the vehicle is in gear. Hopefully the communication will come back to the engine ECU to say, hey, no, it's all good. It may also communicate to the vehicle control unit just to make sure that nobody's holding the button because it wouldn't want to remote start if there was somebody in the vehicle. So it can check sensors um, just, just to see if there's anybody or any occupants within the vehicle already. It will also then communicate or possibly communicate out to the ABS control unit, make sure the vehicle's not moving. And then the, that, those same units will then report back via the CAN bus to the engine control unit. If all the messages that the engine control unit come back as OK based upon its programming, then it will then operate the relay to start the engine. Now, built within the engine control unit, it may then have a timer system built in that may be programmable so that when you actually come to a uh, when you actually have started it it will only run for a certain period of time now part of that is um part of that is is a protection to make sure that the vehicle isn't going to start and then run all day and all night um, some of that might be because it might be starting in a confined area so you don't want it to be able to um, cause any injury to anybody um, there's a variety of different reasons why you may have a certain timing to it but once it's figured it out, you know, once it comes to the end and it turns itself off, that's all good. Now, this shouldn't be confused. The remote start shouldn't necessarily be confused with some of the remote starts you have on other vehicles. For example, on some heavy vehicles, it has a remote start function. And that definition is that you can program a certain amount of features to it. For example, if it, the air temperature inside the cabin got too cold, it could start the engine to heat it up. If the, batteries, uh, if the batteries were getting low on charge, so if you're sleeping in your truck, um, if the batteries get low on charge while you're watching the TV, then it can automatically start the, tr automatically start the truck to build up the, uh, the, the battery levels. Uh, you can set it also to um, start the engine if your diesel fuel was getting too cold. And that's really important when you start getting into some of those snowy, those places with snowy seasons where the fuel can get too cold. So they use a remote start, um, not so much a remote start from the button. They define a remote start um, and, and sometimes a remote start stop in terms of a function that it can do um, without the necessarily the driver being present. So a uh, couple of different ways it can function. Even then, it's still using this. It's still doing the same process as you do with a remote start um, from a key fob. And that is it will then check via the security unit, the transmission unit, vehicle control, etc., etc. It will then talk to all of those to decide whether it can start the engine or not. So none of this is a guarantee. Now, the good thing about remote starts, even if it is a bit of a first world problem initially, Having said that, as I explained, it has commercial problems. <laughs> there are some other problems that we can come across, and it's something like this.
if we had this scenario, it would be really great then rather than having to do this, we could actually start the vehicle up without getting into it. You know, when the door rubbers have actually, or the door seals have managed to freeze against the door frames uh, and you can't get the doors open, that's a really great function to be able to start the vehicle up and to actually get it nice and warm so that it will melt the ice that's holding it all together. So there you go, that is the remote start stop. That is the last of the features that we have in our starting systems. Now there are other starting fe uh, features and starting systems out there. As I said, this is a generic look through. Um, uh, there are gonna be different functions, different ECUs, different names for things. Um, even between the start stop functions, you are gonna find that there are different start stop name or different names for those start stop functions even if it is what we call it start stop as a generic uh, and that's just part of the automotive life so answer the answer the questions in your workbook answer the questions that you have and online before moving on to the next section